Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I know that you, like me, are very sorry that Raymond Plant is not uh, well. Uh, and it means that particularly people who have been following uh, his uh, course and been looking forward to the next instalment are going to be a bit uh, disappointed. So I'm stepping in. Uh, I'm a huge admirer of Raymond's uh, approach. Raymond I've known for very, very many years, and I hugely admire his approach to these issues, which, as you know, is a very, very careful unpicking of the uh, arguments and a very careful uh, weighing uh, analysis and weighing of one thing uh, with one argument with uh, uh, another. Uh, but I have to face the fact that our approaches to these issues are slightly different. The way I think I would put it is that Raymond is primarily a philosopher with theological interests, uh, and I'm primarily a jobbing theologian with a philosophical interests. So we totally overlap, but we approach them from slightly different points of view, which I think is what you will uh, find from me uh, this morning. So uh, although my starting point uh, is that chapter from his book, which some of you, I think, have seen. Those who have been following his course have seen that chapter, and I'm, and I'm covering some of the ground in that chapter, uh, but I'm not going into uh, all the detail of his arguments. I'm not going to try to give his lecture uh, for him. Um, I'm going to begin uh, with a, a point that he makes towards the end of that chapter, uh, when he refers to Joan Lockwood uh, O'Donovan, who is very, very critical of the whole concept of human uh, rights, because, as he puts it, embodies too attenuated a concept uh, of the person, and one which will, over time, transform the public realm into one that is dominated more and more by private conceptions. And what Joan uh, O'Donovan actually says is, the public, on this view, the public realm suffers from moral monism, being enslaved to one universally acclaimed good, that of individual self-determination. Increasingly, uh, all communal and institutional aims, aspirations and claims must be articulated in the individualist language in order to be heard but this language is unsuited to express the purposes and structures of laws of diverse communities. It's equally unsuited to express the goods of law uh, of, of marriage uh, and, uh, and so on. Now, I have a very great deal of sympathy uh, with her criticism of the very individualistic way of looking at issues in our society now, and I'll be coming on to that uh, at, the, uh, at the end. Uh, and the point of beginning with that quotation, however, because, uh, as you know, there is a fairly widespread antipathy uh, to the whole concept of human rights in some quarters, and you yourself may have something uh, of that uh, antipathy uh, about them. Uh, first of all, there's criticism uh, about the emphasis upon uh, entitlements, uh, there are some people who say that we should be talking much more about responsibilities uh, and rather less on uh, rights. And there are other people who feel uh, that what they call the human rights agenda has been fed up as, a, as the ultimate standard in the light of which their own uh, religious values are being judged, whereas they themselves would regard their own religious truths as the highest standard in the light of which everything else should be judged. Hence, of course, we've had those very well-known cases in the, hum in the Court of Human Rights in Europe about things like wearing crosses, about uh, whether a, a person is free to discriminate against somebody uh, on, uh, because they're same sex, uh, and, and, and so on. Now, I think the first point that I would want to, to make uh, is that a reference to human rights is not in itself individualistic or in any way selfish, because the whole human rights movement, which has gained such momentum since World War II, is, has been about protecting the rights of other people, so that organizations like Amnesty International and Watch Human Rights, they're constantly on the lookout for those countries where people's human rights are being 
uh, violated. And this is very, very much a concern for the other, a concern for, if you like, the community uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a whole. So I believe uh, that uh, we shouldn't uh, go along with that kind of suspicion uh, of human rights, particularly the suspicion from some uh, Christian quarters, uh, and that we need to see it uh, in its full historical uh, perspective. Um, and I think if you look at, at that, I would argue uh, that uh, the human rights movement, which began with the Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, will be judged by future historians as one of the great, huge achievements uh, of our age. And I would also argue that it actually has fundamentally Christian roots. Uh, first of all, I would want to argue that although uh, in the Middle Ages, for example, people didn't on the whole talk about uh, rights, they had morally based laws. And if you have, for example, a law against stealing, what does this imply? But people do have a right to their own property. Uh, that if you have uh, a law uh, against harming other people, uh, what does this imply? But you have a, a right to a certain inviolability of your own person through uh, unwanted and asked for brutality uh, on your person uh, by others. And so uh, those laws, at least implicit, have a theory of rights behind them. Uh, and furthermore, the medieval thinkers would certainly have argued uh, that the basis of these laws would have been uh, in the divine law and particularly uh, the, the natural law. They're not just legal enactments, but there are legal enactments which are finally, ultimately uh, grounded in, uh, in the moral uh, law. Um, and it is, I think, also uh, worth uh, noting uh, that uh, the great sort of founders uh, of the whole modern rights movement in the 18th century, although some of them certainly weren't believing Orthodox Christians, uh, they were uh, very often deists. They believed in one creator, uh, God. For instance, the American Declaration of Independence in 1776 stated, all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable uh, rights. Now, Thomas Jefferson, the main architect of that declaration, and some of his colleagues, they weren't what we would call orthodox Christians. Uh, they were uh, deists, but nevertheless, uh, that did imply at least a belief in the one uh, creator, uh, God. And I think it's no less important to note uh, that this rever religious reference is made uh, even by the French Declaration, because that French Declaration was made, quote, in the presence and under the auspices of the supreme uh, being. So Roger Ruston, the Roman Catholic theologian, uh, looking at the thought of Aquinas and the 16th century Spanish theologians and John Locke, it rightly concludes, in my view, so the apparently secular discourse of human rights, far from being something alien imposed on religious life from outside, has grown from within a religious tradition in response to its deepest insights into God's creative presence uh, in, uh, in the world. And I think it's also worth noting uh, that actually some of the prime movers behind uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 uh, and later on the two covenants, the one on political rights and the one on social economic rights, were actually leading Christians at the time, leading uh, Christian statesmen on the continent uh, and leading Protestant states, uh, churchmen in the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches at that point was much more significant then than it is now, and they also had quite a significant influence on that. So I would argue that it's a mistake to think uh, of human rights as something, as it were, set up by uh, a secular mindset uh, uh, as a superior yardstick over any kind of religious view of the world, it emerges within a Christian tradition, out of a Christian tradition, and very often as a result of significant influence by Christian thinkers and Christian uh, statesmen uh, with, with in it. 
Now, one of the main issues that uh, um, Raymond uh, discusses uh, in his chapter, of course, uh, is uh, really what is the, what is the basis uh, for our, our, our human uh, rights? Can we find some kind of universally agreeable principle on which they can be based? Now here I do uh, take a rather, rather different approach to him, and it's the, perhaps I, this is the point to mention it, uh, that uh, I have a, a chapter in this book called Faith in Politics, question mark, Rediscovering the Christian Roots of Our Political Values, which has just been reissued two days ago with a new long introduction for uh, the general election year, and there is a chapter in that uh, on human rights. And in that book, I do take a slightly different approach uh, to uh, Raymond. Uh, my starting point uh, is uh, the American legal philosopher who sadly died last year, Ronald Dworkin. And he wrote, anyone who professes to take rights seriously must accept at the minimum the vague but powerful idea of human dignity. And similarly, the great international thinker Amartya Sen finds the basis of human rights, quotes, in the ethical principle that every individual has claims to the attention and regard uh, of, uh, of others. Uh, and I would want to suggest that whatever uh, arguments we might put forward uh, to justify the fact that our fellow human beings, every single human being, has a unique dignity and status and should be treated with equal respect and concern. Whatever arguments we put forward, in the end, we cannot escape the need for some kind of act of recognition and uh, response. Take, for example, somebody whom you regard as a great friend of yours and they, you try to explain to them why they are a friend. Well, you can give all sorts of qualities about the person. Uh, you can perhaps describe various ways in which they behave. Uh, but in the end, I would suggest that it is a matter of beginning to see uh, what you yourself see in that person, uh, a unique human being. Uh, when uh, I first met my wife, uh, I was the envy of everybody because she, her, it's her indulgent father had given us her a beautiful light blue new MGA car, the nicest MGA car that ever made. Of course, everybody accused me of going out with her simply for the sake of her car, because I had to convince her that it was for her, herself. It was because of her beauty. But she might then have said to me, well, you know, what happens along the, you know, the, the Beatles song? What happens when that goes and I'm old and wrinkled and we're both of us old and wrinkled now? Will you still love me then? And of course, genuine love means that in the end you'd simply love a person uh, because of what they, they are, simply uniquely what they are. And I think this is brought out very well in a play by the Irish writer Frank McGuinness, a play called There Came a Gypsy Riding By. In this play, a family meet together on the anniversary of their son Jean's suicide. They're given a note, he wrote, indicating no reason at all as to why he had taken his own life. And they're dumbly distressed both because of his death uh, and the fact that he gave no reason for it. Uh, and then the father says to his wife, I looked into his coffin the morning of his funeral. I said something to him that nobody heard. I've not told you nor the children. I told him if I were given one wish, I would go back in time before he was born and I would not change him, Jean. I would still choose him. I would not change my child, no matter uh, what. And that's a remarkable statement. And what I think he is trying to suggest uh, that there is a fundamental act of appreciation of someone being loved and of value and worth simply as they are for uh, themselves. In fact, uh, Montaigne uh, is very good on this. In his essay on friendship, he says, if a man urged me to tell him wherefore I love him, 
I feel it cannot be expressed but by answering because it was he, because it was myself. It is not one special consideration, or two, nor three, nor four, nor a thousand. It is what, not what kind of quintessence of all this co-mixture which sees my will. The unique person, the unique blend of characteristics and qualities which makes each one of us a special, unique person. And commenting on this, the philosopher Margaret MacDonald has written, Yet it is also correct to say that our decisions about worth are not merely arbitrary and intelligent choices are not random. They cannot be proved correct by evidence, nor, I suggest, do we try to prove them. What we do is to support and defend our decisions. The relation of the record of a decision to the considerations which supported it is not that of proof to conclusions. It is much more like the defence of his client by a good counsel. And so in a similar kind of way, I would argue uh, that, as Ronald Dawkins has said, uh, that human rights are simply based in a recognition of the fact that humans, qua humans, have a unique dignity. And we can put forward all kind of arguments in favour uh, of that, but in the end, uh, it does, and we should perhaps put forward all sorts of arguments, but in the end it does act, uh, depend upon a particular kind of act uh, of, uh, of recognition. Now, I think I entitle the chapter uh, in my book on this subject, Does God Believe in Human Rights? We believe in human rights, but does God believe uh, in human rights? Uh, after all, many passages in the, in the Bible, unfortunately, give the impression of just the, the opposite by modern standards. And there are some horrendous stories in the Bible, aren't there? Well, I find them horrendous. I don't know whether you find them horrendous, but I, but I certainly do. The violent everything we mean uh, by the sacred nature of the, the human. And certainly there are passages even in the New Testament which seem to suggest that God can do what he likes with what he wants. St Paul, for instance, says, well, we're like, really like clay in the hands of a potter, and can't the potter do what he wants with his lumps of clay? To which the answer is, of course, well, we're not lumps of clay. We are human beings. And I think I would want to suggest uh, that God, through the very act of creating us, does endow us uh, with this special dignity and worth, which he himself recognises as such. Even though he is the creator of all things, he recognises the value of what he has created. There's a very well-known story about Winston Churchill, who had his portrait painted by Graham Sutherland, and his wife and he so disliked it that uh, his wife had it destroyed. Now, they might very well have said, well, they paid for it, they own it, surely they can do what they want with it. But supposing they had a Titian uh, that they intensely disliked, and they decided to destroy that, what would we think of that? Wouldn't we want to argue, actually, there is something very uniquely valuable about that Titian, that they had no right to destroy, even though they had paid for it? And so it is that we sometimes we put preservation orders uh, on houses, uh, on trees. Uh, we recognise that there are certain aspects of, of, of beauty and art of the natural world which, own, which, as it were, override any concept of the absolute power of ownership. And in a similar kind of way, I would argue that us human beings, as the creation of a good God, do have a dignity and worth in ourselves which God recognises uh, as such. But I don't think that is enough to ground uh, a fully developed concept of human rights because the fact uh, of a fundamental fact about the world in which we live uh, is that day by day our basic human rights are denied and violated. And the reason that we have legally stated human rights, quite simply, is because of that fact. In a human family, when relationships are going well, we don't talk about human rights, do we? Uh, we rely on people's sense of care for one another, their sense of belonging to a human family, that we almost instinctively make adjustments so that people have their fair share and they're able to participate 
uh, equally uh, in what is happening in the family uh, and share in the, in the good things of that, of that family. We don't talk about human rights in the, in the family. And if the world was a perfect place, of course, we would not talk about human rights uh, in, in, in the world, but we do need to talk about them. And so I would argue that the sort of theological basis for human rights is first of all the fact that we do have this worth and value in ourselves uh, as children of God, but secondly, we need to have those human rights legally enforced because we live in a world where we don't act as a loving family, but we act as a family that destroys uh, and disparages uh, one, one another. Now the point about uh, human uh, rights uh, is, as Ronald Dworkin again has put it very powerfully, is that they are political trumps. I think that's a very brilliant image. Dworkin has written, individual rights are political trumps held by individuals. Individuals have rights when, for some reason, a collective good is not sufficient justification for denying them what they wish as individuals to have or to do, or not a sufficient justification for imposing some loss or injury upon them. If someone has a right to something, then it is wrong for the government to deny it to him, even though it would be in the general in interest to do so. And of course, the classic example here uh, is torture, or if you like, water, waterboarding. It was no doubt argued by uh, some Americans at the time uh, that it was in the greatest interest of the greatest number of people in America, their safety and security, uh, that these techniques of waterboarding should be applied uh, to people. If you believe that that was a form of torture uh, and uh, that uh, one of the most fundamental human rights is that people should not be tortured, then no reason of state can override that political trump. That's the point. No utilitarian argument, no argument of any other kind about the good of the greatest number uh, can override the simple fact that a human right, particularly the human right not to be tortured, is a political uh, trump. Now, a good example of the kind of misunderstanding that can occur uh, was when Tony Blair seemed to suggest that he wanted to re re rebalance the relationship between the rights of suspected terrorists and the right of the community for security. As he said, the demands of the majority of the law-abiding community have to take precedence. But this idea that it is a cost-benefit matter is a deeply misleading way of looking at it. Cost-benefit analysis is an important form of reasoning for most public policy issues, but not in the case of human rights. As Ronald Dworkin put it, commenting on Tony Blair's view, this amazing statement undermines, undermines the whole point of recognising human rights. It is tantamount to saying that there is no such thing. Now, obviously... There are many rights which don't have the kind of absolute status that many people would regard the right not to be uh, tortured. Uh, but that is a kind of, I think, a definitive example of what is meant by uh, a right, that it, it does stand up uh, in its own right against all forms of utilitarian uh, reasoning. Now, again, you might want to put forward kind of arguments uh, one way or the or, or, or what, in in favour of that, but in the end it comes back to uh, an act of recognition about the uh, about the human per person. Um, perhaps just a, a couple of other things to be uh, said uh, before I move on to something uh, else, and that is that in 1966 we had these two covenants: the International uh, Covenant uh, on Political. Uh, at civil and political rights uh, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And I think most people on the basis of fairly obvious common sense uh, would say that there is a significant difference between the two kinds of rights because civil and political rights can be and should be observed 
by all states in whatever state of development they are, uh, but obviously social and cultural rights do depend in, to a significant extent uh, on the state of economic development of that particular kind of, uh, of society. Uh, if you say, for example, uh, everyone has a basic right to universal free health care, uh, that might very well be something which was possible uh, in an advanced country like ours, but it might not be possible because of economic uh, conditions in some other country at the world uh, at, the, at the moment. Nevertheless, that having been said, there has been a very, very strong movement, particularly uh, by liberation theologians, to say that we should regard uh, social uh, and economic rights uh, with the same kind of force that we regard civil and political rights. For instance, uh, Jose Bonino, one of the Latin American liberation theologians said, for the vast majority of the population of the world today, the basic human right is the right to human life. Uh, the deeper meaning of the violation of formal human rights is a struggle to vindicate these larger masses who claim their right to the means of life. The drive towards universality and the quest of the American and French revolutions, the aspirations of the UN Declaration, find its historical focus today for us in the struggle of the poor, the economically and socially oppressed for their uh, liberation. Now, even if you don't fully go uh, along with that, in other words, if you cannot place social and economic rights on exactly the same par as civil and political ones, it is clear uh, that if we believe uh, in human rights, if we believe in social and cultural rights, then there must be a push and a drive and a dynamic to work uh, to bring this about so far uh, as, we, uh, as we can. Now, the reason that uh, Raymond uh, dealt with uh, human uh, rights in his chapter, uh, and in particular, he goes into a, an argument between Alistair MacIndar and Gerwith in very great detail that I'm not going to go, do with, but uh, if you have a copy of that, you may want to read it. I think it's better read than, than me talking about it. But the reason that he deals with human rights uh, at all is because he thinks that human rights is a good example uh, of people trying to find uh, a, a universal basis uh, for the moral values or uh, the moral outlook uh, of our society. The fact of the matter is that we do now, of course, as we know very well, live in an extraordinarily diverse society. Uh, there are, what is it, something like 2.4 million Muslims in the country, something like a, a, a million uh, Hindus. Uh, at the last census, something like a quarter of the, uh, the population now self-identifies as having no religion at all. Uh, in a society which is now as as diverse as ours, uh, what kind of basis is there for the fundamental values of our society uh, and what, is the, what are the principles on what those, those value, values uh, are, are held? And it is for that reason uh, that Raymond was dealing with human rights because that human rights are put forward as something which can bind us together as a society, uh, whatever uh, our our, our, our views are. Uh, and here uh, in his uh, chapter he suggests that there are two ways in which uh, we approach this whole question. Uh, one is to look for uh, universal, rationally based principles uh, on which we can all agree, uh, whatever our views. Uh, the other is what he calls either the communitarian philosophers uh, or the narrative theologians uh, who say, well, there are no such universal principles which are, as it were, neutral as far as any uh, uh, understanding of the common good is concerned. Uh, uh, taking your stand with Alistair MacIntyre uh, from the point of view of philosophy and theology or Wittgenstein uh, and other people, uh, there are these narrative theologians and communitarians 
who would argue uh, that, in fact, uh, all our moral values are, are rooted in particular virtues and particular practices of a tradition. And you cannot extract them from that tradition. You have to stand within the tradition. And Alistair MacIndar, uh, in particular, has argued in his books, both his History of Ethics and After Virtue, that concepts like duty, for example, now float around in our society, free of any proper moorings in a, tra in a tradition. That's why we, we find it so difficult to talk about what, what, you know, how one might justify concepts of duty, because it's floating free. It originally had its, had its proper place within a, a tradition, with a, within a total, uh, total world uh, view. Now, I take a view, I approach this um, uh, in a slightly, from a slightly different perspective, and I don't think the debate is quite so polarised as it's sometimes set out between, as it were, uh, universally, rationally justified principles on which everybody can agree, what are their, their view of life, uh, and a tradition-based set of, 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 of values. But I would certainly start, I think, uh, with uh, the letter, with, with the latter, uh, and I would start where I, where I would before, as I've, I've mentioned, uh, with the fact of uh, human dignity and our recognition of that and our desire to respond uh, to it. But with, I think, one important further development, uh, and here I come back to what I would agree with about uh, Joan Lockwood, and that is we do have much too individualistic a concept uh, of uh, what, what it is to be a human being, I think, in the modern world. It would be much better to have a much more African concept where they put it, they use the word Ubuntu, that is, we are always persons uh, in relationship to uh, other persons, uh, and we are always part of a, a, a society. Um, and so my starting point, I think, would not just be the, the dignity of the individual person, uh, but the dignity of persons in relationship to other persons. And I would indeed start with this view embedded uh, within a Christian understanding of what it is to be a human, to be a human in relation to uh, other, other, other persons. But uh, I don't uh, think uh, that that view is confined to uh, Christians. Um, Raymond quotes uh, Stanley Hauerwas, uh, who is one of these narrative theologians, uh, who does believe very strongly uh, that actually all moral values are tradition-based and you can't get a kind of bridge between uh, those traditions and other, other traditions and that there is no neutral ground. Stanley Hauerwas uh, has said that what was wrong with apartheid was not that it offended against some universal account of human nature and human rights, but because one could not be a Christian at the Lord's table and treat other people like that. The source of the moral concern is to be found within the particular community with its narrative, which presides, provides the sources of moral concern and for moral uh, uh, agency. But I would uh, suggest uh, that, uh, for a, from a Christian point of view, uh, that if you, of course, you find your concern for others partly as a result of the fact that you gather together around the, the Lord's table, but the Lord's table, to put it in rather theological language for a moment, is meant to be a, a, a kind of sign or foretaste of that ultimate banquet of the kingdom of God into which all human beings are, are, in, are invited. Uh, and I would have thought that it was, it, it was fundamental to all human beings that we are, uh, we are able to recognise something of the dignity of other human beings. You don't have to be a Christian uh, to do that. You don't have to, be, to see it in terms of gathering around the Lord's table. You can see it simply by virtue of the fact that other human beings are human beings. And I would justify that from the kind of thing that St Paul said, for example, um, St. Paul was quite clear that we, all of us as human beings have consciences, 
that we're all capable as human beings of distinguishing right from, from wrong. And the various passages, for example, in the epistle to the Romans when he, when he does that. And so, although we may indeed begin from our own tradition, uh, I think that it is possible uh, to find common ground with people from other religious uh, traditions. Um, and if we like, we can use uh, what the philosopher John Rawls call, calls and, and asks for, uh, and that is an overlapping consensus. John Rawls thinks that we need an overlapping consensus in order to find the values that we agree on as a society. And I have no problems with that. I start off as a Christian, but I see no problems uh, about looking for an overlapping consensus with other people, humanists, Hindus or whatever, who, can't, who approach this from uh, another, another standpoint. And if this means to some extent leaving aside specifically religious language and putting it in more humanist language, again I find no difficulty about that at, at all. Uh, one of the best Christian thinkers on these subjects at the moment is Nigel Bigger and his recent book, uh, he argues that it's a mistake for Christians always to look for something distinctively Christian in what they say. He says what matters from a Christian point of view uh, is uh, that there should be an integrity about your thinking so that your viewpoints and what you say can be shown to, to flow in a natural way from your fundamental Christian and theological base. That's what matters. It doesn't have to be distinctively Christian uh, in, the, in the end. And I believe that we should be trying to achieve uh, uh, an overlapping uh, consensus in our society. Uh, and I believe uh, that it is much more possible to do this than some skeptical, skeptical people uh, believe. Now in the uh, new introduction to this book and also uh, to some extent in the last chapter, uh, I quote Michael Sandel, whom some of you uh, will have heard or read, uh, and a whole range of, of other people who are making the same point, people like Tony uh, Judd, for example, and Marcia Sen, who argue uh, that our society over the last 34 years has been driven by a combination of, of social liberalism and market liberalism. Uh, in other words, the only value which people have regarded as, as, as truly overriding all others uh, is the value of free choice, um, both socially, so that people can choose whatever lifestyle they want, want and in terms of the market, just let the market rip. Uh, and Michael Sandel, in a whole series of very vivid examples, you'll know if you listen to his recent lectures or read his books, he argues through these examples, these telling examples, that actually this whole policy is totally bankrupt. And one of the most telling and shocking ones comes from Germany, where somebody advertised for a person willing uh, to be cooked and eaten. Uh, 200 people responded to this advertisement. Uh, four people uh, applied and were interviewed. One was chosen and was duly cooked uh, and eaten. Um, the German authorities found that they couldn't indict him for murder, but they did get him on another, on, on, on another charge. Now, if you look at that example from the standpoint of the prevailing philosophy of our times, of social and market liberalism, what is wrong with it? They needn't have inquired about the position. They needn't have answered the position. They needn't have applied for it. They needn't have been interviewed. Even if they'd been accepted, they need not have gone through with it. It was a, it was a totally free contraction, conformed to all the no norms of social and market liberalism. People can choose what they want to do with their lives. This is a free market. And that was a market in cooking and being eaten, if you like. Um, but of course, it horrifies us. It totally horrifies us. Because there is, if you like, something as crude as a gut instinct, a sort of moral sense that there's something fundamentally wrong uh, in a society where this is, is uh, uh, allowed. And Michael Sandel, Sandel argues uh, that we need a much thicker concept 
uh, of the public good, uh, of the common uh, good. Now, one of the reasons why people talk about human rights at all and why they talk uh, about, uh, about rights uh, is because uh, people think, rightly or wrongly, that there is now no agreed concept of the common good. If you go to a religious tradition, there is an understanding of what the common good of humanity consists of. But we now, allegedly, all have very, very different concepts of the, of the, of the common good, uh, and therefore we have to deal with rights. And as John uh, Rawls has put it, you know, rights comes before uh, the good. That is his... Uh, that is uh, his position is uh, that's what his position uh, is but I wonder whether in fact uh, there is a greater sense of shared common good uh, than people uh, allow Michael Sandel uh, has has said uh, that the problem with the average liberal position the average liberal position and I'm slightly caricaturing, uh, is uh, that we all have a different understanding of the common good, uh, and therefore we cannot bring our ideas of the common good into the public realm. Uh, we have to talk about th things like rights, uh, which are allegedly free from any concept of the common good. Uh, but, uh, as he, he put it, fundamentalists walk in where liberals fear to tread. Uh, that what has happened in, in America uh, is that some of the public airwaves have been taken over uh, by fairly vociferous right-wing people with a very strong concept of the common good. Uh, liberals have been frightened of getting into that debate because they think we all have a, a very different concept of the good, common good and we keep out of it altogether. But as I said, said, fundamentalists walk in where liberals fear uh, to tread. And he thinks that that although we may indeed uh, start off or think we start off with very different understandings of common good if we come from different religious tradition or a humanist tradition, he suggests that we actually have to work at it. Uh, and as he, as he put it, to achieve a just society, we have to reason together about the meaning of the good life and to create a public culture hospitable to the disagreements that will inevitably occur. And I think that's what we should be doing, reflecting the situation where we are now uh, in, our, uh, in our society, uh, that we, should not, we should, should not be content simply with this combination of social and market liberalism, uh, and that we should try to work up from the bottom, as it were, some agreed consensus about what the common good of our society uh, consists of. Uh, and I think that it is, it is possible that we needn't despair about that. Now, it won't, of course, be the same concept of the common good that we had in this country before the Reformation. Before the Reformation, of course, there was a shared understanding of the common good of our society, which, of course, came from the Christian faith, which dominated as every aspect of human life. We're not going to get that, as it were, top-down concept of the common good. But there is no reason why we can't, as it were, work at it from the bottom, engaging with one another and building it up. And I believe that that is what uh, we should be uh, doing. Uh, one of my uh, favourite uh, statements uh, of what this common good might be like actually comes uh, from uh, T.S. Uh, Eliot. Um, he uh, says... Uh, it would be a society in which the natural end of man, virtue and well-being in community, is acknowledged for all, and the supernatural end, beatitude, for those who have the eyes to see it. Now, in my book, I slightly modify that and develop it a bit, but and I leave it with you as a, something to be, to be thought about. Um, clearly, it is Aristotle... Uh, as modified by Thomas Aquinas and brought up up to date, uh, and none the worse for that, I hope you might say. Uh, but let me just repeat that again. This is his idea of the common good. 
it would be a society in which the natural end of man, virtue and well-being in community, is acknowledged for all, and the supernatural end, beatitude, for those who have the eyes uh, to see it. So what I've tried to do this morning, and I'm just going to open out now into some discussion on some of this, I started off uh, by talking a little bit uh, about uh, human rights and how it is that I would ground human rights uh, in a concept of, of human uh, dignity, which has to be recognized as such. It can be argued for, but in the end it has to be recognized. Uh, and uh, that when we set human rights within the, with the, within the larger picture, uh, that from a Christian point of view I would justify those human rights from within the Christian tradition. But I believe uh, that starting in that tradition and other people starting in their traditions, it is possible to work at a concept of the common good. And I think I would argue also that actually, although Rawls says rights comes before uh, the good, uh, I think I would want to argue that actually, in the end, you probably can't understand what is right or wrong apart from some concept of the common good. So with that, and apologies again for not being Raymond Plant, I open up to you uh, for any discussion you might like to have on those themes. Thank <clears throat> you.